All right, so this talk, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've always wanted to visit um, TAC. Unfortunately, we have to do this virtual, so maybe in the next time. Um, so this talk is gonna be about the landscape of parallel programming models, because I've been living in this landscape for quite, quite some time. Um, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. So a little bit about my company, I'm not gonna to talk too much about it because um, you can always read these slides later on. Um, I'm a distinguished engineer with Codeplay and thank you very much. I have been involved with um, C++ for quite some time, I'm now chairing the C++ Future Directions Group. Um, but I've, in, the, in my past life, I've actually also been the CEO of OpenMP. So NTAC was a, was a key, open, is still a key OpenMP member. So I want to talk a lot about how I see the landscape of where parallel programming, concurrent programming, heterogeneous programming is heading. But because of my company affiliation, I've been more involved now with, um, with autonomous vehicles, AI, machine learning, and the safety of machine learning algorithms um, important for using, um, doing, using uh, standardized programming models for AI and uh, acceleration. The usual um, acknowledgements and disclaimer, um, nothing work like this cannot be done without numerous people being involved and helping me. So I wanna make sure that I acknowledge them and any error that remains are purely mine. And so the usual legal disclaimers indicating there's good, I'm gonna use some company logos, which I might not, uh, I'm gonna attribute to whichever those companies belong to. So let's start off. Um, this is a three act um, talk. Um, it's first part, I wanna talk about performance, portability and productivity. The second part, I wanna talk about um, what I kind of call the four horsemen of heterogeneous programming. And then the third talk, I'm gonna call C++, uh, OpenCL, OpenMP, Sickle, and talk about those programming models. Um, by the way, do I need to turn on my, my video or are you okay with me off the video? I think whatever you like is fine. All right. Yeah, you're fine. All right, that's great. It's probably better for bandwidth if I'm off the video then. All right, so part one, performance, portability, productivity. I, the, that's, that's a picture of my cat, but there's actually no cat in this picture. I figured that I've been told that any talk that usually have cats in it will, will usually improve it. So if Google can monetize cats, why can't I? So let's see if we can start on the first question that's gonna be asked. And so the thing that I wanna talk about that has been asked around is, isn't parallel concurrent heterogeneous programming hard? And of course, Houston, we have a software crisis. And since we're in Texas, I thought that was appropriate. So what are the goals of parallel programming? And when I say parallel, I kind of think about all three, parallel concurrent and heterogeneous. Generally, I like to think of it in terms of what I call the tri iron triangle parallel programming language design. I've been a language designer for upwards of 20 years now. Um, and it turns out that these three factors are deeply involved when you're thinking about a parallel programming language. So you might be surprised that in this list, productivity is one of them. You probably are not surprised that performance and portability are in there. So why does productivity make the list? Well, I would say that given that pro parallel programming is perceived to be much harder than sequential programming, productivity is tantamount and therefore it cannot be omitted. Now, performance is obvious. Um, given the recent trends on, on the, the part of all the major manufacturers toward multi-core, multi-threaded, uh, heterogeneous system, parallelism or some form of it is the way to go for those wanting to avail themselves the full performance of their system. Now that said, just because you have multiple CPUs or GPUs is not necessarily in and of itself a reason to use them all, especially given the recent decrease in price of multiple CPU systems. The key point to understand here is that parallel programming is primarily a performance optimization. And as such, it is one potential optimization of many. If your program is fast enough as currently written, there's no reason to optimize it either by parallelizing or by applying any of a number of potential sequential optimizations. By the same token, if you are looking to apply parallelism as an optimization to a sequential program, then you will need to compare parallel algorithm to the best sequential program. So are there no cases where parallel programming is about something other than performance? 
Well, there certainly are cases where the problem to be solved is inherently parallel. For example, Monte Carlo methods and some numerical computations. And even in these cases, however, there will be some amount of extra work managing the parallelism. I am now working much more on autonomous vehicle and therefore safety critical. And parallelism is also sometimes used for reliability. Um, for except for this one example, triple modular redundancy on the right here, uh, uh, triple modular redundancy on the right here has three systems uh, running in parallel and vote on the result. In extreme cases, the three systems might be independently implemented using different algorithms. So productivity, that's the big question. Um, what productivity has been becoming increasingly important in recent decades. And to see this, consider that the price of early computers was tens of millions of dollars at a time when engineering salaries were but a few thousand dollars a year. If you de can dedicate a team of 10 engineers to such a machine and improve its performance, even if it's by a measly 10%, then their salaries would be repaid many times over. So given how cheap parallel systems have become, you all have a parallel system in your pocket, your phone, maybe even in your kitchen. Um, how, can, how, how can anyone afford to pay people to program them? Well, there are a number of question answers to these questions. One, of course, given a large computational cluster of parallel machines, the aggregate cost of the cluster can easily justify substantial development effort because the development cost can be spread over a large number of machines. Um, that's what you guys are kind of involved in. You might, be, you might also be involved in a popular software that's run by millions of users, like a Windows operating system. And this can easily justify substantial developer effort because the cost of this, this development can be spread over the millions of users, okay? Or three, if the low cost parallel machine is controlling the operation of a valuable piece of equipment, then the cost of this piece of equipment might easily justify substantial developer efforts. Four, if the software for the low cost parallel machine produces an extremely valuable result, like maybe finding gold or oil, um, then the valuable result might again justify substantial developer effort, effort developer costs. And then I talk about safety critical systems that protect lives, which can easily justify the cost of large developer efforts. And then of course, hobbyists might, and researchers might just wanna seek knowledge experience, fun, or glory rather than gold. So it's not the case that the decreasing cost of hardware renders software worthless, but rather that it's no longer possible to hide the cost of software development within the cost of hardware, at least not unless there are extremely large quantities of hardware. So this is about performance and product portability and productivity and what I call this so-called iron triangle or parallel programming nirvana. Those of you guys who've been team leads will know what this means you will have probably have used, seen the iron triangle in, pro um, in process when you are trying to do a project and trying to balance resources and time and feature. And usually if two of those expands, the third one has to be reduced or something like that or fixed um, to make it possible. So the truth is that there are now languages that can give you a way of accessing all the speed in your system unless those hardwares are really truly esoteric. The candidates have been trying to do that um, have the individ individualities though. So I name a few here. OpenCL is kind of C-like. It's assumed to be low level, highly performant, lower productivity than a C++ language, but very portable using a very clever OpenCL um, Spear V layer um, that allows high level code to be written and a vendor shim layer to translate the IR to a large number of devices. OpenMP, um, something that I know TAC is working very closely with, works for multiple languages, C, C++, and Fortran, using similar compiler directives. And that's one of its strengths. I, I kept selling that when I was the CEO of OpenMP. And this makes it easy to use um, yielding higher productivity. And because it's based on three general purpose language, languages, it's very portable. The issue of performance has been under debate uh, when compared to descriptive languages versus prescriptive language. And I'm not gonna get into it here because I lived through that fight for many, many years. <laughs> um, CUDA is great, but it only works with one device kind if from NVIDIA and does very specific to the device kind, but it does yield excellent performance because of how specific it is. And, you, and its productivity is improving as it moves away from its C-like pedigree towards uh, full C++ support. 
And that's one of the areas you can see the trade off there. Instead of trading, off, trading down portability, you now have excellent performance and productivity. Sickle um, is a Kronos heterogeneous C language that integrates unobtrusively into modern C 11, 14, and soon 17, but leverages OpenCL for portability to multiple devices. And so they offer this, it offers the same high performance as C, similar portability as it inherits from OpenCL. And the productivity gain will be on par with that of C, which is to say that it is higher than C. So strange though it may seem, although parallel programming is, is indeed harder than sequential programming, it's not that much harder. Maybe the people complaining about parallel programming have forgotten the fact that in every day we deal with parallelism in our lives. Um, drivers deal naturally with other cars, sport team members deal with other players, referees, and sometimes spectators. So nevertheless, um, parallelism can pose difficult problems for longtime sequential programmers, just as Git, um, the repository, framework can be a long, uh, for, can be um, uh, a problem for long time users of revision control systems. These problems include design and coding habits that's inappropriate for parallel programming, but also sequential APIs that are problematic for parallel uh, programs. And concurrency is even harder than parallelism. And the consumer world is more about concurrency, whereas the high performance computing world is more about parallelism. Okay, so when I was involved in OpenMP, I've always wondered why high performance computing and consumers never use the same parallel languages. Over time, if there was a chance at conversions, I was hoping that something C++ like would be it. Because you see, on the one side, what I saw was a lot of use of OpenMP and OpenACC. Um, both have a huge, rich background of experience. And then on the other side, people were using a, mis a mismatch of TBB, OpenCL, some CUDA, um, maybe there was Silk for a while there, there. So I would love it. I was always dreaming of something like one API where hopefully we could converge. And I think for the first time we can. So I thought about this and if we could just focus on one language, it is a possibility. So for the future, we definitely do want to be able to easily support multiple uh, devices that we have today, like all these different kinds of heterogeneous devices we have here, um, including even to um, FPGAs, um, integrated AC, uh, CPU and GPUs, and DSP units. Um, so we've, we, when you go to Hot Chips, which is the conference that, that you go to to see all the latest um, designs for, for, for latest chips, many of them seem to be focused these days on adding onto machine learning, of course. And that might be the, the fact that it would, they would include different kinds of CPU on board with different kinds of accelerators like machine learning or vision, a GPU, a DSP, IFPGA or coarse grain reconfigurable arrays, lots of IO with different power domains and various on-chip memories. So this is now the design of a modern multiprocessor uh, system on a chip, mostly because of power consumption reasons. So when we think about that, um, we can now see that looking back, there are just certainly uh, many different kinds of fundamental parallel architectures. Uh, the most obvious one starting with the basics, of course, is a uni processor. And then quickly from there, we, we started moving into what's called a single, what's called SIMD uh, systems, where we have single instructions with multiple data. This is your typical vector system, okay, where you have a processor, but also a, um, a vector stream um, that's represented in red here on the diagram, okay. And then also quickly after that, we started seeing single instruction multi-thread, multiple thread systems or SIMT systems. I want to talk about that. But at about, the say, at about the same time, or be just before that, we started seeing SMP systems, the, shared, the type of shared memory multiprocessor system that have shared memory address space, have a bus-based bus -based memory system. These are processors that have um, onboard uh, CPU vector units, okay? So things, are, things like, um, like AVX, um, AVX or, um, or the one from AMD, the one from IBM, everybody had their own, own versions and their own way of programming them. Um, these things might be connected through a bus or through some sort of inter interconnection networks. That's pretty common for a long, long time now. So just what's the difference between SIMD and SIMT? Well, it's important to understand this, this particular idea, obviously, is that 
with vector, with SIMD, um, they have vector register instructions with 128 to 512 bits. So a single stream of instructions drives multiple data elements. And SIMT is a single instructions, multiple threads. This is where we have a single stream of instructions that drives many threads instead of driving multiple data elements. So there are more threads than functional units. And over and you use something like over, over subscriptions, the high, the latency, and it's optimized for throughput. So just to complete the picture, we also have, of course, the typical distributed and network parallel architectures. Distributed uh, memory multiprocessors uses um, commonly known message passing interface between the nodes. They're connected by interconnection networks with their, each processor with their own memory. And then you also can move into what's called massively parallel processors, MPP. That, these have many, many, many processors. And then you can also get, have clusters of SMPs where there is a shared memory addressing within the SMP nodes and then message passing between the SMP nodes um, used to going through the interconnection networks. And these can also be regarded as MPP if the processor number can be very large, okay? Then moving on, we see modern parallel architecture. So, so after we build up the basics and the distributed architecture, you can see that in the modern parallel programming architectures, we have the multi-core many-core groups, which is uh, the cores can be hardware multi-threaded, like hyper-threading. But now, over the last 10 15, 10, 15 years, we also are seeing the heterogeneous groups, like the CPU with a discrete GPU variety. The discrete GPU obviously is using the SIMT. The CPU is using the SIMD. Okay? And then we are now also seeing the few CPU, GPU, uh, they call them integrated or APUs, where the processor, the CPU processor and the GPU is now on, on, on the same chip. Then of course, moving slightly beyond that, we have the heterogeneous CPU plus the many core CPUs um, that is pretty common, um, that has an interconnection uh, network with a network interface. And then of course, it's not too far beyond that is the heterogeneous multi-core SMP uh, plus the GPU clusters, where now you're hanging off a GPU card off of every uh, processor. And each processor itself also has SIMD. So these multi-core SMP GPU clusters, they have shared memory addressing within the SMP node. They have message passing between SMP nodes and they have GPU accelerators attached. So the question that comes up often is how do you program all these? And do you use different programming model? Well, often these days you do. You use uh, for the multi-core, many-core varieties, you could use, for instance, OpenCL, you could use OpenMP in the top left, you can use Sickle, you can use some form of C++, 11, 14, 17, and 20, that's coming up. You can use Thread Building Block, you can use Silk, and you can use pthread. If you're talking about the heterogeneous discrete CPU-GPU combinations, that knocks out a few, um, but also adds a few other ones. For instance, now you can only use C++, some form of C++ 17 and 20, uh, because only those have a slight capability of going to GPUs, but not complete. But now you also are, are available to open ACC or CUDA, if it happens to be an NVIDIA type card, or HIP, or Rockham, or C++ AMP, or some sort of built-in intrinsics, or OpenGL, or Vulkan, or CUDA, or DirectX. If you're talking about a, a integrated system, you're probably talking about an AMD style system, but lately Intel also has some of them as well too. So now you're talking about maybe um, um, OpenCL, OpenMP, Sickle, C++, 17 and 20, HIP, uh, Rockham, Intrinsics, OpenGL, Vulkan, and DirectX. Going to the right, if you talk about the heterogeneous uh, CPU many core, again, the same kind of list appears Okay, because there's no GPU card, you don't see the GPU specific languages, but generally OpenCL, OpenMP, Sickle, and C++, and some form, some other parallel programming language can be used. And then next after that is the most, um, the most uh, number of variety with a GPU card hanging off of each CPU within the cluster. And now that reduces your options now to uh, mostly OpenCL, OpenMP, Sickle, or C++. And of course, unless you're talking also, because now we have to talk, talk about programming both the CPU and the GPU. Otherwise, we would add um, 
um, uh, something like CUDA or HIP or Rockham to the system, unless you want to program them separately, of course. So, which programming model works on all the architectures and is there a pattern? It turns out that there is a fairly normalized pattern of programming languages that can do the job without you having to change your programming language. And that's generally have always been some form of C++, OpenCL, OpenMP, and Sickle. And that's why these languages are becoming pretty standard in the, in the high performance computing domain, unless they want to keep changing the language as different hardware shows up. And I know that that's not what you guys want to do. So to support all the different parallel architectures with a single source code base, and if you also want it to be an, an open standard, and if you also want it to be growing with the architectures, you really only have a few choices. It's really just mostly OpenCL, some form of C++, Sickle, and of course, OpenMP. I'm gonna to try to take questions at the end if I can, but as I continue, um, I'm gonna go take a look at now the what's going to call the four horsemen of heterogeneous programming languages, something that I've been looking at closely because I've been involved with designing programming languages for a very, very long time. Now here's a graph that's very interesting for me. It's um, by Simon McIntosh Smith of University of Bristol. He, um, he runs a um, bunch of benchmarks that test heterogeneous systems to see how fast they are, whether they're memory bound or compute bound. And this is a list of publications um, he does it by checking how many published papers and publications there are in different languages. And it's quite interesting to see that um, right now still um, at the top of the graph right now today in 2019, um, uh, you have CUDA. Um, they just do a fabulous, a fantastic job at publishing more and more papers. And then below that is OpenMP. Um, I was the CEO of OpenMP from 2011 to uh, 2016. I believe. Um, and OpenMP pretty much stayed where it is. It's gone down a little bit, but that's okay. It's still right up there. Um, below that immediately in the little blue, the blue line is MPI, okay? That has always been um, um, with a large number of published paper. And then climbing rapidly over the years have been OpenCL in green there. Now, lower than that, you see a couple of lines on Silk, on Thread Building Block and OpenACC. And since 2014, um, Sickle has started emerging uh, with more and more papers published. Okay, now here's the thing. I want to talk about this, the reality of how much we can do in terms of performance, productivity, and portability. The real answer is that the right programming model can allow you to express a problem in a way that adapts to different architectures. And that's really the tricky aspect. Now, if I were to look across different um, levels of parallelism in your chip, in your computer, you can use different, abs different abstractions right now. If you want to write um, to the cores or to hardware threads, you could use something that is directly in C++. Um, if you want to look at vectors, um, C++ doesn't have it yet, but OpenMP does. Okay, I should add OpenMP there. Um, if you want to look at things like atomics and fences, um, things that have to do with lock-free data structures, um, C++ offers a lot of that capability. If you want to do parallel loops, well, a lot of, pe a lot of people can do that. Async, uh, OpenMP's um, parallel um, um, regions, um, C++ 17 parallel algorithms, TBB. Um, if you want to do heterogeneous offload these days, um, you can look at OpenCL, you can look at Sickle, you can use, look at HSA, you can look at OpenMP. There's also the National Labs, Cocos, Raja, and of course, CUDA. If you wanna look at distributed, there's HPX, there's MPI and UPC++. Um, if you want caching, um, the C++ 17 does have something called false sharing support. Uh, and if you wanna look at NUMA, uh, OpenMP and ACC. Other things that is still in the research level is how to handle thread local storage on discrete uh, heterogeneous devices and how to do parallel exception handling in concurrent environment. There's still a lot of work that has to be done in that area. But let's see what happens if you look at what I call the four horsemen. And they, I call them four horsemen because having um, um, designed pro parallel programming and specifically um, heterogeneous programming languages for a long time, I've known that it's always, I, I've learned that it's always um, come down to uh, 
four the, the four problems that were, uh, that that I call the horsemen. Um, the problem the point is that over time, um, if assuming we want to keep our goal of portability and performance, um, then we can took, take a look at the kind of frameworks like Cocos, uh, Raja, HPX, uh, Seco. Uh, OpenCL and CUDA and how they solve these problems. And it turns out that to maintain some performance and portability, you usually have to deal with them. And it and these are after working on all integrating GPU um, programming model into mainstream language, starting with IBM cell compiler, then OpenMP, then Cocos, then Chrono Seco, OpenCL, and ISO C++ is now also adding heterogeneous programming. It's fairly clear that these are the prevailing problems of our age. These are the usual challenges um, for performance portability and the four, and what I call um, the four horsemen of heterogeneous computing. And they're basically data movement, the, the ability to move data um, across the bridge from um, CPU to GPU, laying out the data, CPU and GPUs have different data layout, um, the affinity of data, um, how close it is to the computation, and the locality of data. Okay, so let's look at each one of these and see a little bit about how each group is solving these problems. So data movement has two parts, either explicit or implicit. I'm going to talk a lot more about that tomorrow, but this is just a little bit of a taste. Most, uh, ex most languages do it explicitly, and only two are implicit. It turns out that you really need both. Now, this is a graph by Bill Daly from NVIDIA that talks about how many um, joules of energy it costs to move data from one side of the chip to the other. Just as just, just a demonstration to show you how, how much it costs, um, not just in terms of time, but in terms of energy. And so in terms of what type of data movement, probably the one thing you will all notice is that there's basically the implicit data movement versus the explicit data movement. Now, under implicit data movement, there's actually only two examples, SQL and C++ AMP. C++ AMP is almost a kind of a dead language started by Microsoft, but they didn't really push it very far. And now it's mostly disappeared. But it did have implicit data movement very similar to SQL. This is where the data is moved to the device implicitly across um, uh, the host. Uh, CPU device data architectures. So in C uh, here, I, I figure you'll see enough SQL later on in the rest of the talk, but and the rest of this conference. But here's how C++ AMP does it. It creates an array view, okay, of floats, and then it creates an extent, okay, a two-dimensional extent of 64 by 64, and then it creates a parallel for each using that index, okay, and don't worry about the restrict. That was a big, big uh, design problem that, that in C++ AMP that, that nobody does anymore. And within the kernel itself, now you can do the computation. You don't know when the data moves across. It just moves across when it needs it based on a runtime um, decision. SQL does very similar things. Um, most of the other ones use what's called explicit data movement. This is where you actually have to move the data very explicitly. And here's, I'm just using a CUDA example, but OpenCL does the same thing. OpenMP does the same thing too. And this is where you have to have a device API to explicitly copy data over. And it's not, it's not magic as to what those um, APIs are. You can see very clearly that what you have here is CUDA malloc, CUDA memcopy, CUDA memcopy the other way after the computation of vector addition is done. So it's, 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 it's a pretty common that most languages go with explicit, but now we're beginning to see that a, tr a good language really needs both, okay? Um, to be able to do explicit data movement all the time is, is a lot of burden if you have a complicated dependency graph. Most of the languages um, that use explicit data movement struggle with that. Um, the implicit data movement do those very easily. But on the other hand, there are also cases where it's, you don't really need a big complicated dependence graph, in which case um, you don't need to build up a lot of these um, dependence, um, these DAGs to figure out exactly, uh, to figure out, to, let the, to give the runtime um, ideas as to when to move the data. So in that case, an explicit data movement is, um, is very useful. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about that tomorrow, okay? Next thing, it turns out that laying out the data is extremely important when you're doing CPU and GPU processing because data layout involves having your own um, type of storage um, that's suitable for CPU and GPU. And 
these demand different treatments. There is now already a proposal um, actually started by the COCOS folks um, aiming to enter a future C++. It's called SPAN and then multi-dimensional SPAN. And it's using the concept of views that, based, that effectively uh, enable you to have a convenient array or matrix using whatever is appropriate um, storage or storage pattern that's adaptable um, um, between CPU and GPU. And this is because CPUs want contiguous caching and GPUs want strided access, which then needs to be coalesced. So this, what this does is it enables a platform agnostic storage pattern that allows you to have a basic um, a functioning array or matrix that C++ has always lacked. And that means you can store arrays as pointers or a wrapped data structure. Now with this basic fundamental ability, you can build on top of it things like linear algebra, eigen libraries. Uh, you might even be able to straddle data structures across um, CPUs and GPU. And of course, um, most of the programming languages that I've talked about like SQL and so COCOS can support the ideas of what's called data mapping. Um, this is the idea of, of, of converting things from a, a arrays of structures to structure of array because one form is always much more efficient. A structure of array is far more efficient because of the, of the layout, okay? So these are things, these are the layout structures that's important. Another th idea is affinity. This is the idea that what data affinity gives you is that it defines when agents and memory is required, required to be near or far. And it's important as the next piece of the puzzle. Some of the agents prefer some memory as a default. And this proposal is actually from uh, us from CodePlay and it's working its way through the committee. It proposes a low granularity and a high granularity interface. A high granularity interface basically enables people who build runtime to manipulate precisely what is needed um, but a but at a low granularity, all you need to be able, or what's called high level, all you need to be able to say is, I want this data to be near this execution point. Um, this is some of the code that is going to be probably be coming through from C++ to allow you to do that. So in a way, everything that we have been talking about is about data locality, and there's going to be deeper questions that we're going to need to answer. With all these changes, and, and C++ is now pushing forward with executors, ultimately to mediate the dispatch of functions to, to accelerate the resources, we're gonna still need to uh, wonder if C++ can adjust to the hierarchical data layout that's common among GPU architectures, so that you might have different address spaces and different co coherence. And that's gonna be another big question that we're gonna have to answer. And that question is still remains right now. So continuing on to the last part, I want to show you some examples of how code is written these days uh, with um, OpenCL, C++, SQL, and OpenMP. Okay, so I'm going to use a fairly common example. It's basically a vector addition. This is called what's called SaxPy or SaxB. It's essentially a single position uh, with a scaling factor A times X plus Y. Okay. And you guys are all pretty much commonly um, pretty familiar with this. So here's a serial SaxPy, um, and it basically has given two vectors, X and Y, and a scalar A. Um, the result of the blast um, primitive SaxPy is defined as base AX plus Y. Um, X plus Y here um, are actually vectors, of course. So. In fact, the ability to do this um, heterogeneously um, has already essentially occurred. Um, when there was just a few, there are now many. Um, honestly, the training wheels have come off and we're now deeply exploring the complexity of the four horsemen in each of these frameworks. It's now not a matter of what heterogeneous capability to add to C++, but when and how to do it in a performance portable way, which is the next closest nirvana. And because it's done in a quiet way using other features that are good for the CPU as well, but also makes, way, uh, makes it possible not to block a future for accelerators, it's also being kind of called the quiet revolution in C++. Um, it's called that because it's not explicitly called out as a heterogeneous technical specification or study group, but yet many people within the committee are making this their priority because similar people um, like from the national labs, from Codeplay, from NVIDIA, from um, from Intel, Google, are all there trying to help to make sure that we enable a possible C++ future 
that supports this. And so how do we incorporate this in the C++? Well, let me just step back for a moment to show you what C++ has. Before C++ 11, I, that would be C++ 98, there really wasn't any parallelism. Now, what I usually do is I break it up into um, um, four columns of, of asynchronous agents, uh, um, collections of things that can be run in parallel, and mutable shared states, as well as what is coming for heterogeneous. Now, under that domain, um, you'll see that in the past, um, this is before C++11, you would have to use things like POSIX threads or for asynchronous agents, uh, concurrent um, collections, you might have to use OpenMP or some intrinsics or TBB. Uh, mutable shared state, you would have to build your own locks. And for heterogeneous programming, you would have to use OpenCL or CUDA. Now, just to see, just to make sure everyone understands what these are, um, asynchronous agents are basically tasks that run independently and communicate via messages. So one example of that is a background, GUI background printing, where when you press a button um, to print, you don't want your screen to lock up. That print command is just an asynchronous agent. And the, the usual metric there is responsiveness. When you have concurrent or parallel collections, you want to be able to operate on groups of things um, and um, exploit parallelism in data and algorithm structure. So these have trees or quick sort algorithm. In this case, throughput or many core scalability is the key. Um, mutable shared state is primarily there to deal with um, legacy code with global variables and so that you can avoid racing with those global variables and synchronizing objects um, in shared memory. So typically we've done, we dealt with that as with very expert or wizard like capabilities like lock free libraries, lock data structures and atomics. And um, the typical metrics is race free and lock free. And then finally for heterogeneous and distributed system, obviously what we like to do is to do dispatch and offloading to other nodes. And we have been exploring those things now um, starting even with C++11. So starting C++11, C++ offer capabilities like um, threads and Lambda functions and TLS and async for asynchronous agents. Some of these you could argue can be used to build collections, but things like tasks, promises, and futures was there to support that. And for mutable shared state, you see that um, it was mostly about a, a memory model, locks and mutexes and condition variables and atomics. But I would argue that even back then, there was already a capability to support some form of heterogeneous and, dis and distributed system using C++11 lambdas. We actually designed lambda with that in mind to be able to be uh, something they can throw off to another thread. And that's the, a special kind of lambda that is um, um, value captured. If it's a value captured lambda, you typically don't have to worry about um, um, uh, maintaining references to um, the, the previous to the out to the external code. C++ 14 added some more things, nothing really significant. It was kind of a fix up release. We added generic lambdas um, and a whole bunch of fix ups for uh, mutable shared states. And then C++ 17, we really ramped up and started adding the ability to have a parallel standard template library for, for parallel collections. And we also added the ability to control sh false sharing. And under mutable shared states, there was a whole bunch of other things, but probably more than you realize, three things contribute potentially to heterogeneous programming. Things like progress guarantees, um, having more defined weak progress guarantees, which is how GPUs behave, um, having what's called toll or threat of execution. This has to do with the fact that C++ standard um, calls things as a standard thread. And standard thread, unfortunately, is usually a heavyweight CPU thread. So by changing the terminology, calling it threads of execution, now you enable the possibility of lightweight threads, which are now different than stand, stood threads, standard thread. Now, lightweight threads, where do they exist? They, they exist in GPUs. And then finally, we added the ability, what's called execution policies. And these policies enshrine the idea that um, some have um, weakly concurrent forward progress um, that allows um, for GPU type of progress guarantees. And this is where um, I would claim that C++ is pushing even further into supporting heterogeneous programming. 
So here's a simple example using um, scalar alpha x plus y in C++. Um, it's, pretty obvious, it's pretty simple. All you have to do, of course, is take the, take the serial code, and then you want to add the parallel aspects surrounding it. And you would start with a beginning and end, and then you would add the number of threads that you would want to activate. And then the, it's very simple to call a thread constructor passing in a lambda expression, okay? And in the lambda expression, you capture the, the Z output in, as a reference capture, because that's where you're going to put the results out. But you capture all the other parts as a value capture. That's without the and sign. So you have X, Y, A, start, and N. And then you build the rest of the expression. And voila, that's all you need for a lambda. That's all you need for parallel expressions. Okay. Um, the, rest, um, the rest I'm going to skip over is just showing a more complicated version of vector, of vector multiply using the typical fork join. I'm not going to explain it too much because you can, it just shows the idea that you might have to look at how many, um, what is the concurrency occupancy of your uh, current CPU to be able to figure out how much tasks to throw onto it. And then when you do that, you get a fairly satisfying um, ability to create a parallel solution of a vector addition. That is nothing more than the same idea that I put out before, but you also now can add things like um, um, querying the number of threads, um, how many um, each thread, what each thread um, um, does, um, and how, how often it loops. And then you would also now need to add an ending condition. But, and, and then at the end, to make all this stuff work, you have to join all the worker threads um, back in order to make sure that you don't lose, uh, leave any zombie processes, okay? So I was, I'm involved with the C++ directions group and in there, um, there's a clause that says, now we want to be able to support the, the modern hardware such as uh, heterogeneous and distributed computing support. And there you have it, a clear direction towards um, heterogeneous distributed C++ in the future. But because it's C++ standard, it takes a long time, as much as possibly six to 10 years for something like this. For instance, in C++ 20, which is gonna come out at the end of this year, uh, you're gonna have things like um, under asynchronous agents, J threads, interruptible tokens. So what that is, is finally we're gonna have cooperative cancellation instead of preemptive cancellation. We're gonna also have support for coroutines and under parallel concurrent collections, we have improved uh, a VEC execution policy. Um, and under mutable shared states, we have a lot of other things like atomic ref, latches and barriers, atomic share pointers. Of these, the most useful for heterogeneous computing of the kind that um, high performance computing likes is probably atomic ref and span. Um, atomic ref is there because it allows you to access non-atomic variables. And this is important because if you have a big program and most of the time it doesn't need at atomicity, it can be a regular variables. And only when you need to get to the um, uh, critical part, you can, make, you can use an atomic ref to reference the, um, the, uh, the non-atomic variables atomically. And it, as long as it's within that same scope, everything has to be atomic reference, uh, you'll be fine. And there's more stuff coming in C++23. You notice that SIMD is finally going to come to C++. And this is how long it takes C++ to catch up to some of these things. All right. So let's, con let's continue on. I'm not going to, I'm going to skip over some of these slides about what's coming in C++23. But C++23. I know your time is basically up at this point. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, and I know you're coming back tomorrow to do more. So I can um, probably save some of this for tomorrow and then continue then. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay. I don't so want to there behind is it. a channel over in the Slack uh, for today's Michael Wong uh, keynote. There will be another one for tomorrow's Michael Wong keynote. Uh, but if you have questions, there was one question in the in the Q and A, which is where do you see DPC plus plus and one API in this landscape? Ah, so I think I think um, so. The question about where see where do I see DPC plus plus and one API? What, so DPC++, just to be clear, is the implementation of SQL plus um, C++, um, some, C, uh, some C++ features, which I think will be th likely things like futures and, and, and executors, and, and additional Intel features. Um, and that's its package all within one API. And so I would say that um, it is an important part 
of having this this one um, this one place where you can compute for CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, and AI processors, because DPC++ flowing through the openness of SQL, which is an open standard through Kronos, allows us to program any of those processors. Okay, and that's where that's where in this landscape this would actually fit. Okay. Great.